listening to Sasquatch Syndicate. And all the ape believers don't want any of the paranormal believers to say anything because they're all whacked and screwed up and we don't want them. And all the paranormal believers don't want to go to the ape believers saying, well, you're all closed minded. You're not open to the fact that that, that it does this and it does that. And I look over my left shoulder and this creature is running through the woods and it's bulldozing the brush down. And I knew, man, this thing is going to get me. Seattle, Washington, along with Paul in Portland, Oregon. Thanks to everyone for listening and those following us at sasquatsyndicate.com and on our social media outlets. For those participating in the Sasquatch Syndicate monthly t-shirt giveaway, this month's winner was David Weaver from Indianapolis, Indiana. So David, congratulations. Thanks for listening to the show. And please check your Facebook for winner notification. Happy March, everyone. Before we begin tonight's show, we wanted to, again, thank all of those out there that have donated to our website or purchased items from our store. All proceeds go to promoting Sasquatch Syndicate programs and events. And again, we can't thank you enough for your continued patronage. So on to this month's show. We have a special guest tonight with us on the podcast is Dr. Jeff Meldrum. Dr. Meldrum is a full professor of anatomy and anthropology at Idaho State University. His academic research centers on the evolution of hominid bipedalism. Dr. Meldrum is the author of Sasquatch, Legend Meets Science, which appeared earlier this season on our book club. And so with that, let's sit back and relax and enjoy this two-hour interview with Dr. Jeff Meldrum. Dr. Meldrum, thank you so much for being here. And, you know, I'd like to say something about Dr. Jeff Meldrum, the man. This man is one of the most gracious individuals you will ever meet. At multiple conferences, I see you interacting with folks and it's just beautiful. On his own, Dr. Jeff Meldrum is worth the admission of any Bigfoot conference. So if you get the opportunity, be sure to go see him. So I I really appreciate you being on the show today, Dr. Meldrum. Well, thank you. It's a privilege. Thanks. You bet. So what got you into the phenomenon of of Sasquatch? Is there one thing that really flummoxed you, you know, as you were looking at that? Or or can you tell us about how you got into this phenomenon? Right. Well, uh, it actually started uh, way back. Uh, I mean, my first exposure was uh, when I was a youngster, and I was, uh, oh, I think it was in fifth grade, and there was chatter uh, at school about a film that was going to be shown at the Spokane Coliseum. Uh, I was a resident of Spokane, Washington at the time, and it turned out I ran home and opened up the paper, and there was the ad. Roger Patterson had come to Spokane with his his, uh, documentary showcasing the you know, 60 seconds of uh, the Patterson-Gimlin film clip, and I, I uh, didn't take much. I coerced my dad into uh, taking me and, and my brother, my younger brother, down to that, and we were there in the third row. I remember distinctly, but right up uh, in front of the stage as this documentary unfolded, and then, boom, here's that in projected larger-than-life image of, of uh, Patty walking across the screen, and it was... Uh, I mean, I guess, I guess, looking at my, looking back now, um, in hindsight, it was something of a life-changing event. It really made an impact, and it embodied all of the interests that were, that were budding in my young mind at the time. Now, you know, as many kids at that age, I was fascinated with all things prehistoric and mysterious. So, dinosaurs and cavemen and whatnot, undiscovered species and lost worlds and so forth. And it was that that fringe, that, that uh, spirit of exploration that always interested me. And uh, so I, you know, I was, uh, I was hooked at that age. Then, you know, as you grow, your interests wax and wane and, and different things come and go and take uh, center stage. And, and this was sort of on the side burner uh, in the background. And, but, but eventually, uh, whether subliminally or overtly, it obviously influenced my choice of a career, and I pursued a, 
a career in, in anatomy and physical anthropology and, and a particular interest in locomotion. I mean, it was that bipedalism, that walking across on two legs that, that fascinated me. And so as the opportunities to study the evolution of, of bipedalism, you know, sev the 70s were the golden age of paleoanthropology with the discovery of Lucy and, and the uh, uh, burgeoning thereafter of, relatively speaking, uh, hominid fossils are extremely rare, but nevertheless, many more discoveries were afoot um, in the in the ensuing decades. Uh, and so I ended up in a position to uh, conduct research on human locomotion using you know both uh, extant uh, models of human and non-human primate locomotion, as well as reconstructing the behaviors from uh, functional analysis of skeletal remains, fossil, fossilized skeletal remains, and footprints of uh, early hominids. And so that placed me in a position when, in 1996, I was shown a set of extraordinary footprints outside of Walla Walla by uh, Paul Freeman that I was, uh, I was quite prepared to look at these very objectively and, uh, and, and also with an open mind having been previously exposed and fascinated by the prospect of such a creature existing. Now, the hairs are standing up on my neck because here are our footprints as clear, clearer than anything I've ever seen depicted in, in uh, publications or books or magazines, and uh, not just a single cast or a single footprint, but a line of tracks showing animation and showing the behavior of the creature as it was, it was uh, uh, walking. And, so forth, and so that uh, that was really what set me down the path. Um, I I can even remember, um, uh, and I've said this before. I can remember a moment when, having familiarized myself with Dr. Krantz's work and knowing his legacy. In fact, it was it was immediately after a visit with Krantz in Pullman, Washington. My brother and I made a detour and and uh, stopped in to visit Paul Freeman in West Summerlin in uh, Walla Walla and Paul happened to have had had have excuse me Paul happened to have discovered some footprint casts or tracks that uh, he didn't bother to cast because he had accumulated so many he said he stopped making casts and that <laughs> they were absolutely perfect and for me the imperfections were the most the most informative aspects of these tracks it was the it was the comet tails the toe drags the pressure ridges and, and uh, tension cracks and all these different things that were quite uh, that were quite compelling. But I remember kneeling there and having that uh, that moment of realization or moment of, of introspection rather. Do you really want to go down this path? <laughs> because uh, you know, because it was it was a, it was a, a weighty decision whether to do anything about this or just chalk it up to an interesting uh, interesting uh, experience because of the potential impact it would have on my academic career. And I thought to myself, how could I not? I mean, uh, if indeed this creature exists, this, this trace evidence certainly attests to it, and more vividly than any example I've ever seen or heard of, um, how, could, how could the scientist in good conscience walk away from such a potential? So here I am, you know, 20 some years later, and and 200 and some plus or 300 plus, I haven't even kept track the number of footprint casts that have accumulated here in the lab, not to mention photographs and of other tracks and traces and so forth. And uh, it's been quite, a, quite an experience in, on many different levels. So, Dr. Meldrum, as you kind of think back on that journey of, you know, here you are, you're entering this discussion about the existence of this, you know, mythical creature. And of course, you know, Sasquatch in the academic community is still widely considered taboo. But what was that experience like? Well, I, I must say I was rather idealistic and quite naive, I guess, uh, at that stage, at that time in 96. I, I uh, had not yet uh, come up for tenure review, which uh, for those not familiar, that's a process where you transition from a uh, annual uh, contract renewal to some job security, and, and that provides a certain amount of intellectual freedom to pursue and to uh, pursue your research and whatnot without worry of of uh, 
uh, constraint or I mean within reason obviously from from uh, the administration and um, or, or your colleagues <laughs> actually it, it much more I mean it never would have occurred to me that that colleagues would be the concern and that was the uh, one of the eye openers for me it turned out that the reaction uh, was quite varied uh, spanned the spectrum from interest and curiosity and encouragement to abject visceral rejection and disdain and uh, and uh, criticism uh, attack you know uh, uh, so it was uh, it was really quite uh, surprising and it's been a it's been a it's had an impact of course it's had an impact and it it has marginalized me in, in, in several quarters and and but on the other hand I you know looking back I wouldn't have changed anything I if anything I would have been even more aggressive and more um, uh, uh, forward in in the uh, champion of this of this data now you know my goal is not to convince my colleagues that Bigfoot exists that's not it at all it's it but but it is to champion the data I mean the data warrant consideration and uh, and the decision should be made not based on some preconception of what can or cannot exist I actually had a colleague say that to to an editor who had solicited a paper from us her response in reviewing the submission was it can't exist therefore it doesn't exist and I don't care what evidence they think they have uh, that's a real scientific attitude isn't it <laughs> All right. you know I just I was I, you know talk if, if anything uh, flummoxed me it was that reaction that kind of reaction to what I thought would be um, would be a, a, an exciting uh, and, and interesting um, uh, undertaking and you know some of my colleagues they try to um, uh, they try to uh, uh, disguise that attitude by saying um, oh you know every anthropologist in the, uh, worth their salt would be just delighted they hope in their heart of hearts that Bigfoot does exist and then they go on to pick apart every single thing um, often from a very superficial understanding of the data or, or no understanding the total ignorance of the data uh, and so um, I mean one one and we might as well use names because they're out there they're in, in the press Eugenie Scott is the director of the Center for uh, the National Center for Science Education and uh, <clears throat> she uh, has also been a past president of the American Association of Physical Anthropologists and We've, we've we've met we've talked we've interacted she has um, she's been very it was in her capacity with the um, the NCSE uh, they keep tabs on the creation science agenda and work very hard to counter this very fundamentalist approach to education and and to science and uh, so we've crossed paths in that capacity in her capacity in that uh, in that role, a number of times, because I'm also involved in in uh, that as a uh, as an, an instructor of organic evolution and human evolution here on campus and so on. And um, she has taken a couple of opportunities. She's also she also sort of flirts or participates in uh, uh, skeptical groups, skeptical societies, and uh, you know those who these ideological skeptics who uh, you know wear the notion of critical thinking and skepticism as if it's a you know a badge of honor rather than just simply one thread in the tapestry of scientific uh, endeavor uh, and for some reason she uh, repeatedly has talked about Bigfoot it was an article just just recently um, about it and again it it's just it's like Swiss Swiss cheese it's so full of holes it's so uh, cherry-picked it's so misrepresentative of the facts and yet done in a very polite very genteel way that you you almost feel bad for criticizing it but but it's it's just shoddy science I mean it just really is there's no two ways about it and so that's you know that uh, overcoming that countering that um, has been uh, an ongoing frustration or it just seems like well, I mean, in some ways, it provides a platform. You know, I try to turn it to to our best benefit, our in the sense of those of us who are more open-minded and think that that it is very worthwhile, and there is 
there is evidence that is very compelling. Otherwise, why would I have stuck with this hypothesis? I would have abandoned it long ago, which is the way in which science goes, is you try to knock the legs out from under a hypothesis. Well, and I haven't been able to do that. You know, the first time I was asked to evaluate a piece of video, I thought, well, this will be an interesting exercise in, you know, applying what we know about comparative anatomy of primates and their locomotion and, and uh, videography and so forth to simply dismantling this piece of video um, evidence. And the closer I looked at it, the, <laughs> the more I was unable to do that. And so, you know, then you have to alter your, you're supposed to alter your um, pre, uh, your original initial hypothesis in the light of that uh, new information. You don't um, try to then force it to some preconception of what can or can't be the case. And in, in defense of, of many of my colleagues out there, you know, during the 60s and 70s and and uh, you know, there was a very different perception of the way in which human evolution has unfolded. And this is another thing. This is a theme that I've been driving for about the last 10 years, and it's now starting to get traction. I don't think it's getting traction necessarily because of what I have been doing. It's just that I've, my voice has been there. And so now it's, as circumstances have finally begun to shift, uh, and sources of data independent of the phenomenon of Sasquatch, you know, in mainstream anthropology, then it's like, hmm, oh well, gee, you know, maybe Meldrum might have something there. But that is simply, you know, in contrast to previous ideas about the way evolution occurred in the human lineage, a notion of what was called the single species hypothesis, that is that, that essentially hominids were so unique such unique, unique creatures, there could be only one species in that niche at any one time. And so the human family tree was kind of like a, a lodgepole pine. It just was tall, straight, central trunk. You know, there might have been a few little side branches, but essentially it was one species that was succeeded by another and, and replaced subsequently by another in a linear fashion. Well, now we know as a result of a growing fossil record that there were numerous contemporaneous species coexisting across the landscape throughout the past seven million years, you know, the duration of the hominin fossil record. And that was the rule rather than the exception. So rather than a lodgepole pine, I mean, we're looking at, at a bush, not even a tree anymore, really. It's a bush that's so, so branchy that there were at times, you know, a half dozen or, or very likely many more as the, given the pace of discovery and given comparisons to living communities of primates, half dozen or more species living uh, contemporaneously across the landscape. Why would the present be the exception to that rule? Especially in the face of so much evidence that suggests that there are some, and this is where my, the term that I've been promoting, that, you know, borrowed from uh, Boris Porzhnev, the Russian uh, anthropologist, the relic hominoids these persistent species of, of uh, members of the superfamily hominoidea, be they ape or be they hominin relatives, close relatives to humans. And so, you know, the, the idea that we have Sasquatch, you know, it, it, echoes, it echoes what Ivan Sanderson uh, proposed in his encyclopedic tome, Abominable Snowman, Legend Come to Life. You know, he, he concluded that there were at least four different types Sasquatch type, a sort of Neanderthaloid type in Russia, you know, the Almasti, uh, a very apish looking uh, type in the Himalayas, and, um, and the Oren Kandek. He didn't deal with the Yao, he really to speak up, but uh, the, you know, a little maybe relic Australopithecine type. Uh, in 1960, there was just no, when that book was published, there was no place in the paradigm landscape of anthropology to accommodate such a suggestion. You know, not only were they questioning the evidence, they just questioned the very possibility of the existence of such things. So they couldn't be real. You know, it can't exist, and, you know, echoing that same sentiment. It can't exist, therefore it doesn't exist. Well, now things are a bit different. That paradigm has expanded and shifted tremendously with more data so that now there there is actually a place where 
we might really expect there to be things like Sasquatch. Jeff, as you think about how evidence collection started and has evolved, especially around Sasquatch, when do you really think that the true, you know, data and kind of the archiving of evidence really started? Well, I, I it probably was um, with Jerry Crew and Bob Titmus uh, when he when when Titmus gave Crew a little uh, crash course in how to make a plaster cast to preserve a footprint then we no longer were just simply relying on, uh, on oral anecdotes. Here was a piece of evidence that could be subjected to very objective and critical evaluation and uh, you know, you know, not subject to the subjectivity of description or recollection or whatever. And, I, and that piece of evidence still exists. I, I had the opportunity to examine that original cast uh, at the home of one of uh, Jerry Cruz's sons, and it was really fascinating to see that in 3D, <laughs> in all its uh, in all its glory, without simply relying on on photographs or, or replicas. I do have a replica cast of it that was made very early on, but it's by, by Bob Titmus, but it's um, it's not of extreme uh, fidelity and quality, and nothing like examining the original. But so so that's it. I mean, documentation. If there's anything that I can encourage the amateur or the uh, or I'd rather prefer they, they, they consider themselves citizen scientists rather than amateurs and, and rise to that, that, that calling, if you will, or that title by training themselves and educating themselves, um, you know, learning about uh, tracking skills, learning to differentiate the distinguishing characteristics of other forms of wildlife, and, and even you know, variations that can be very misleading you know, when you see uh, a bear track or overlapping elk tracks even sometimes give the impression of toes, the rounded lobe at the back of the of the hoof of a of an elk um, when they walk uh, and uh, by in, in a group and superimpose their imprints can can uh, I, I've seen examples that are amazingly uh, uh, toe looking and uh, boy you know your search image your your eye goes to that that uh, rounded impression of a, of a toe-like shape very uh, readily. But the point is um, uh, educate and, and gain training, you know, take tracking school, um, uh, cultivate wildlife observation, you know, know, know about the habits, uh, and, uh, and, and document. So make that plaster cast or take that photograph carefully not from an angle 10 feet away, but standing straight over the top of it with a, um, a standardized printed scale right next to it. I actually had some, you know, someone as, as often uh, they do, they, you, you stand with your boot, your foot rather, next to the footprint and snap a picture. Well, that was fine, and I kind of uh, uh, gently admonished the, the in individual that I don't know what size your foot is. You can <laughs> right. tell me, but I, I, you know, I have to take your word for it. Two weeks later, his boot arrives in the mail. <laughs> <laughs> that was funny. Uh, so anyway, but those kind of things, and, and that this was what motivated uh, the um, the first field guide that I published, Sasquatch Field Guide. When I was approached by the company Paradise K that that produces a whole I mean, they've got a whole catalog now that's about, uh, you know, almost a half inch thick with all sorts of different catalogs and, and field guides and so forth. Um, but they approached me about the prospect of writing a field guide to Sasquatch. And I thought, well, you know, at first blush, I thought, well, how in the world would you write a field guide about something that we don't really know for certain anything? And, uh, and then I thought, well, gee, uh, but what about a, a how-to field guide? How to collect evidence and distinguish it, and you know what to look for, and how to dis how to differentiate and document and report it, and so that's what uh, it, it tries to accomplish. It has things like you know what are the field marks, what are the distinguishing characteristics that would set aside um, a set off a, a visual encounter. So it's not just a flash of fur you know, that might be a bear, or even maybe an, a moose or an elk seen end on. Um, how do you differentiate footprints from humans and from um, uh, bear, which are the most common misidentifications because they're essentially flat-footed and, uh, I mean, they're down on their heel, that is, with uh, five toes. But there are very distinct characteristics to distinguish them from what we think are footprints attributed, attributable to Sasquatch. 
you know, signs like co how to collect hair, how to screen it in the field so that so that I'm not inundated with with uh, uh, bag after bag of deer hair or um, you know or, or uh, uh, bear or, or whatever, which uh, often is the case, and and so on down, and, and even looking for cultural signs. I mean, I'm, I'm fascinated by the Native American traditions and and uh, the fact that these populations who have been indigenous and, and resident and and presumably interacted with um, uh, all forms of wildlife, including a very rare man-like creature, which is figured um, very centrally in, in some of their um, uh, artistic renderings or representations or or symbolically sometimes. That's an interesting one. And uh, to see the continuity and some of the remarkable similarities in descriptions of characteristics and behaviors across uh, large geographical areas is, is really quite fascinating. Yeah, you know, Dr. Meldrum, one of the, the interesting things that your book, uh, Sasquatch, A Legend Meets Science, did for me was I was really one of the folks that, um, to me, a photograph was the sexiest thing I could see, a video or a photograph. You really mm -hmm. opened up my world to foot anatomy and how p absolutely right. powerful that is and how difficult it would be to uh, simulate something like that uh, with the right. toe splay and whatnot. I thought it was really interesting. but. Can you tell our listeners about the moment that you had that epiphany, that you felt that there was really something going on here? What was that emotion like, and, and what was that piece of evidence, that thought or photograph, or, or what was it that really, that really hit you? What was that epiphany that you had, and, and what was it like to feel that? Well, yeah, it, it goes back to that encounter there outside of Walla Walla. That's really what, what started it. I mean, I... Even back, you know, when I was a youngster, uh, I actually, and, and I, I don't know if I even discussed this, but um, I, I was fascinated by by what was portrayed in, in Patterson's film. I, um, upon leaving, the, he distributed uh, a sample newsletter from what was then the Northwest Research Association, his organization. And uh, and he you know tried to keep up. I don't know how large the membership was, but uh, the membership came with um, some uh, perks, in, which included a, a uh, 11 by 14 black and white print of the 352 frame, a 5 by 7 color print. And I still have those, and they are by far some of the clearest. I'm not sure how they were produced by what medium, but they are remarkably clear, and a facsimile, a replica of one of the footprints from the film site. Unfortunately, it was a very poor facsimile. It was made of an epoxy, but the mold, they hadn't produced a mother mold. They hadn't done it very professionally, and so it was very flat. It, it, it was, I think it was intended to be just kind of a, a desk ornament or a wall hanging, but uh, you know, when the mold was filled with epoxy, it wasn't cradled in a mother mold, so it didn't have the natural contours that are so evident. I mean, those are two original footprints that were cast immediately after the fact and were very fresh. I mean, when you look at good, clear photographs of those, the, um, the detail, the contours, the obvious articulation of the toes and so forth is, is very, very evident. And for, unfortunately, this facsimile just didn't do it justice. So I was quite disappointed with that. But I would, would go out in my, in my yard, in the garden, with a, a collection of spoons <laughs> and a trowel, and I actually would, would – um, and, and a photograph next to me of one of the footprints that I was interested in, and I would very carefully model this in the dirt, in the mud, smooth it out and everything, and then make my own facsimile of some of the classic uh, examples, like the Bosworth cripple foot and and um, the uh, the big 16-inch uh, you know track that was cast by Patterson in '64 or '63. Cliff says it was he had information it was 63 instead of 64, as it was published in the book. In any case, but uh, um, so I was uh, I, I was already familiar with the details of of some of that anatomy even at that age. Uh, but kneeling there, like I said, in front of these remarkably clear footprints in 1996, and and having that realization set in. 
uh, you know, up to that point, it was always, well, this, this is a fascinating proposition, and I could see it being real. But when I saw these prints and could appreciate them from the position of expertise that I had arrived at after years and years of schooling and training and experience with various artifacts and so on and examination of, of uh, an observation of, uh, of, of real organism, uh, it did. It did. I mean, it just kind of hit. It did hit me. There was that that moment, that epiphany, as you described. And that's like I said, that's where the hair stood up on my neck, and I realized, my gosh, the Sasquatch actually walked by here last night or early <laughs> this morning. I mean, that's the only way I could account for it. I could not. I would sit and point out details of anatomy, just you know, uh, remarking about them uh, there with. Um, Paul Freeman and company, and I'd look up at him, and he would have this, he'd be nodding politely, but he didn't know what in the heck I was talking about. I mean, he didn't understand, and I wouldn't have expected him to understand the uh, subtleties of the anatomy of the foot. I mean, there are very few people who who do appreciate that from an academic point of view, and and, and even some in the, in the professions of podiatry and orthopedics. They're very versed in, uh, I've had these uh, roundabout discussions with a couple of individuals, one in particular who who just could not wrap his head around some of the uh, comparative aspects and evolutionary aspects of the human foot. From a clinical point of view, he was fine, you know, but his criticisms of my modeling of the of the Sasquatch foot were, were very uh, baseless. But anyway... Um, well, what were the yeah, criticisms? What, what was that individual speaking of, and, oh. and what were those criticisms? Well, one of them, for example, one that has been a bit of a lightning rod has been my suggestion that a distinguishing characteristic of the Sasquatch foot is the is uh, the mid tarsal break. Now, unfortunately, you know, sometimes a little bit of knowledge can be dangerous, <laughs> and uh, Sasquatch enthusiasts have often glommed onto that. Not uh, some some in a very positive way, and 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 in a very informed way. Others in a not so, and some have criticized it, saying, you know, a break would disable a foot. Well, I'm not talking about a fracture. I'm talking about a an axis of flexion. The break indicates a a greater range of flexibility through the mid tarsal joints, and it's a it's a pair of joints uh, through the bones of the midfoot there, the instep which in humans have been remodeled in such a way that as they, as the foot twists, the joints lock into a closed pack position and very stable position that helps to support the longitude and the large. Yeah. So, so what is the, the evolutionary advantage or disadvantage of having right. a metatarsal break or not? Well, right. Well, it's, it's a first of all, it's a, see it as a retention of a more primitive trait. So the, let's turn the question back around first of all and say, uh, why have humans evolved the longitudinal arch as part of their adaptation to walking on the ground? And that is to stiffen the foot, create a more stable platform, one through which the plantar flexors of the, of the ankle, the calf muscles, could evolve into uh, uh, a, a muscle group with a very... Um, a uh, stout tendon, a long Achilles tendon that produces a marvelous elastic storage mechanism for endurance walking and running. We load that when we run up on the balls of our feet. Okay, so we, we are running machines, and, and that's a very recent innovation. The primitive condition, which we find in, in uh, non-human primates, like uh, uh, the apes in particular, the grass-climbing apes that have a divergent big toe, um, they have this midfoot flexibility as, a, uh, as an, uh, an adaptation to climbing up inclined supports like, like tree trunks or branches, and it allows the front part of the foot to be a pincher, a grasping machine, a prehensile organ, um, while the hind foot remains the propulsive organ. It's the lever arm with the fulcrum at the transverse tarsal joint. So you can still lever the center of gravity up, you know, the body mass up uh, uh, in relative to this support, point of support maintained by the grasping forefoot without disrupting that, that grip. 
So when having come to the ground now, the uh, the large, you know, um, uh, well, I don't say gigantic, but it's a large Bigfoot. Well, we'll, well, I'm sure we'll come back to the Gigantopithecus or not. But uh, on the ground uh, and with the loss of the divergent big toe, the transverse tarsal joint is has retained that that degree of flexibility as an adaptation for walking up steeply inclined um, terrain rather than uh, walking and running on the flat in the lowlands, basically, which is where the human adaptation has been uh, refined. And so it, it's an elegantly adapted foot. By by, re, by retaining that flexibility, and uh, and not having a, a striding gait with a, dif, uh, a distinct heel strike and toe off, which concentrates plantar pressure under the foot to a degree that just can't be tolerated given the mass of this very large creature, then uh, we have a, a very broad foot, very broad heel, broad foot that distributes that weight. And rather than pushing off through the toes and you know isolating the big toe as the principal force of push off, as in the human, with an arch, the foot flexes, pushes off from the forefoot, the toes providing traction when walking on the ground, or actual prehension, a gripping ability when climbing up uh, you know steep hillside. And it's, it's just an elegant adaptation. And and I'm quite confident in that interpretation. For two reasons, two two real prominent reasons. Well, actually, there's many more. There's lots of other forms of evidence that all align with that uh, model wonderfully. But the two most striking are: you can watch the Patterson-Gimlin film and see the actual action of the foot that I've just described taking place in that subject. It's not an artificial prosthetic foot. There's just no way it is possibly. The toes flex, dorsiflex, and then they go down to. The heel uh, rises almost to a vertical inclination while the forefoot is still in contact with the ground. And then the push-off comes from that midfoot. And, and some of the tracks have uh, preserved that kinematic, that dynamic action in the form of a mid-tarsal pressure ridge. And the deepest imprint is not through the big toes. And there's not a differential imprint of the big toe versus, versus this lateral toes. The deepest point of imprint is in the forefoot, right there, in fact, underneath the navicular. Um, and so it's uh, – and then the second point I, that I alluded to was the, the trip I made to uh, China for a documentary. I think it was, it was Monster Quest. And uh, we had the opportunity to examine a set of footprint casts that had been made by uh, the uh, witness there, who was a park ranger at the time, and the tracks – bore just an uncanny resemblance to the the Titmus casts from the Patterson Gimlin film site that show that mid-tarsal pressure ridge so distinctly. And he had no he had no concept, no idea of those. Uh, his reaction when he saw a figure in a paper I shared with him that I had published that showed that particular cast very vividly depicted in three perspectives, uh, he just I mean, he lit up. He just got so so animated and excited, and he was thumping his index finger on that image and looking at me, you know, nodding to me because he couldn't speak English. And sure enough, when we finally uh, then were given the opportunity to, to unveil his cast and, and discuss them, I was, you know, there I was, uh, well, I don't know if flummoxed is the right word, <laughs> but I was just flabbergasted, really, because here – I mean, there, you couldn't have come up with a better copy of, uh, or, or uh, uh, resemblance. No, I won't want to use the word copy because that, for what that might construe for some people, um, uh, resemblance to the Titmus cast. I mean, it was just remarkable, uh, right down to subtle details of the sh not only the pressure ridge, but its position, its orientation, the outline of the forefoot, which shows this kind of differential bulge immediately behind the the talonavicular joint where the head of the talus is being driven down during the weight bearing and the cuboid on the outside, which is a little further this displaced a little further distally, uh, giving that, that pressure ridge a slight inclination towards the toes on the outside of the foot. Um, I mean, yeah, it's just 
Uh, that, that's, I mean, yeah, yeah. You, you, you sit and consider this, and then you, people ask for the smoking gun. I mean, short of having a body, for me, that, that's the smoking gun. That's the, that is just the. And there was another one. If, if, if you'll indulge me, there was another one that Absolutely. was just um, uh, Cliff Berrickman, uh, Finding Bigfoot, came to Pocatello uh, for one of their episodes, and they made a very brief, kind of obviously obligatory visit. To, uh, to announce their arrival here in in my lab, and and so I gave them a really really quick uh, uh, run through with some things, and then off they were to their various uh, assignments. And Cliff had some time off, so he came back and spent uh, several hours in the lab. And you know, it was like uh, turning the kids loose in a candy store. He was pulling drawers out and pulling casts out and lining them up and taking pictures and asking questions and so forth. So I just kind of turned him loose and. And uh, after a while, he called me. I'd gone into my office for a moment. He called me back and said he had these two casts set side by side, both from the Walla Walla area, these one, one attributable to Paul Freeman and one to West Summerlin, separated uh, by, oh, you know, some distance geographically, but by a year or two in, 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 uh, temporally. And, uh, and the one, I know the circumstances quite well. West Summerlin told me this, and that's a fascinating story itself. So, very, in a nutshell, uh, Wes and his wife, uh, Pee Wee was her nickname because she was a very, very small, uh, short in stature. Um, and he wasn't much taller, actually. But uh, they were taking their granddaughters up into the mountains for a picnic. And uh, as they uh, were driving along, all of a sudden the girls who were in the back of the pickup bed rapped on the window and said, Grandpa, stop, stop, we saw some tracks. And sure enough, he backs up and they're on the shoulder. You know, the, the roads up there, so many of them are are unimproved, un, uh, and so they're just really dusty, graded uh, uh, dirt roads. Here were tracks on the shoulder road and, and then veering off down a, a trail. And uh, the one was particularly clear, so he always had plaster in the back of the truck by this time, and so he grabs some plaster in the mixing bowl, and, and the girls are following the tracks down the trail while he's executing this cast. And he said, don't go too far, you know, don't go too far. And so as the cast was setting, he and Pee Wee walked further down the trail. They could see the girls' tracks superimposed over these 15-inch tracks. And then all of a sudden, here's another set of the same 15-inch tracks uh, entering onto the trail and superimposed upon the girls' tracks. And that unnerved him a little bit. It had obviously circled around and, and was now tra trailing the girls' Um, on the trail, and uh, he yelled down to them, and and uh, so they came running back, <laughs> didn't see anything, so it, it had apparently stepped off the trail. But anyway, grabbed up the, the, the cast very, very quickly. It was still a little green, obviously, and it broke, and he grabbed the pieces, and uh, they jumped in the car and took off. He, the, the thought of, of one of these, you know, because the, the native traditions and whether – whether this was in the back of his mind or not, it kind of reminds me of you know the the Chapman story up there at Ruby Creek, where the Mrs. Chapman, who was concerned that uh, that this creature might be after her children, and didn't want her children to see it because of the bad luck it might bring them, and so shielded them with a blanket as she as they uh, 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 made their escape out the back of the, the cabin and down to the railroad bed on to the village. But anyway. So this was one of the tracks, and then the other one, um, uh, Cliff had these two sitting side by side, and he said, Jeff, these are from the same individual, aren't they? Meaning from the same Sasquatch, not the same witness. And I said, well, you know, I've, I've often wondered that, but there are those, particularly Randy DeHinden, who made a big deal about some of, these, some of this evidence because of differences in the angle of the tow row in some tracks. Uh, and, and, and he argued that, that this, this attested to their uh, lack of credibility because in one particular row of tracks, the tow row changed from very inclined to just quite squared off across the end of the foot. I actually managed to alienate myself from him mm. uh, very early on by contradicting one of his <laughs> – we were up at Harrison Hot Springs, and I, I'm sorry if I, I, if I digress here, but we were up at Harrison Hot Springs. The first time I presented my impressions of some of this evidence, this was uh, the uh, the uh, uh, Redwoods video 
uh, or also ignominiously known as the Playmate video. And uh, he was, uh, uh, Daniel Perez had sort of taken me under his wing and was introducing me to people. He was, he was very gracious to do that for me. And he wanted to introduce me to Rene. So he, after lunch, we were going heading over to uh, where Rene had his trailer parked. And there on a picnic table, he was spreading out some snapshots of one of the, uh, I think it was the Tiger Canyon trackway from uh, those cast, uh, quite a series of footprints, casts that were uh, made by Paul Freeman. <clears throat> and Rene had been there on the scene as well and had photographed them. And he had these photos laid out, and he had a, a group of, uh, uh, you know, a, an assemblage of groupies around him, uh, doting on every word he said. And and he's he's pointing out how how the toe angle was changing from one step to the next which was impossible. And I'm looking over, you know, from the side there, haven't been introduced or have interrupted him. And I, I had the audacity, I guess, in hindsight, to simply interject. And I said, well, excuse me, but, you know, you don't have the footprints lined up properly. And he turned and he looked at me, you know, we hadn't formally met or anything. And he goes, what, what? And I says, well, well it, it, uh, you've got to line up the sidewalls of the track in order to to uh, evaluate the orientation of the tow row. Uh, you've got this, this track angled out this way and this one angled this way. And I, and I reached over and I just rotated the photograph so that the, 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 the uh, sidewalls of the two tracks lined up and lo and behold, the, foot, the toes lined up as well. And he goes, no, no, no. He said, I snapped a picture. I stepped forward. I snapped a second picture. I said, well, it doesn't matter where you're standing. The matters, the, what matters is the orientation of the footprint. That's it. That's it. <laughs> that great. He goes. He goes. Are you scientists? You PhDs? You're all blah 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 blah. And I got the, you know, a tongue lashing there in front of everyone. <laughs> and from then on, he'd have nothing to do with me. And you know, uh, within uh, one day of actually making his direct immediate acquaintance, you know, <laughs> that was too bad. But the point was, here we were looking. Cliff and I were looking at these two tracks, and and so with this. With this past experience in mind, I'm going, you know, you know, I've always just kind of hedged because uh, some have placed a real significance on the orientation of the, uh, of the toe row here. And then it just it, – it's one of those situations where sometimes the right question has to be asked at just the right time, and this was it. And, and the penny dropped, and I go, but wait, what if we assume they are, and we, and we take this and we turn the track, the cast, so that indeed the toes line up? What happened? Well, when you did that, it kind of it, it was not as clean as the example with um, Rene because these footprints looked quite different. One of them was very flat, toes you know jutting forward. Um, the other was a little twisted looking, almost to the point where it almost looked like it had an arch. And I've had people point out to this, you know, Dr. Meldrum, you're always talking about a flat, flexible foot. But this foot looks like it has an arch. And I tell them, well, a chimpanzee, which has a flat, flexible foot, can also step in such a way because of that flexibility. Its foot can twist a little bit so that the medial edge is raised up. But it doesn't have the appearance uh, precisely of, of a uh, very adapted longe permanent longitudinal arch of the human foot with a highly differentiated ball and raised medial arch and, and so forth. Anyway. When I rotated the one um, so, such that the toes lined up, indeed the forefoot lined up perfectly. The only difference between the two tracks was in the angle or orientation of the heel segment. And the point of inflection in the, in the track that was more crooked, as I said, was precisely where we would place proportionately the transverse tarsal joint. And so this, this perfectly illustrated a motion in the foot that we call supination versus pronation. Now, most people are familiar with the term pronation. If someone has pronated feet, say they have fallen arches, they're overweight a bit, and they're knock kneed, and their foot kind of rolls inward. And if you see, uh, you know, someone at the swimming pool walking like that, you look at their footprints, instead of having a real narrow waisted hourglass shaped foot they have a broad foot with a bulge even on the medial side 
instead of an indentation. The bulge is the head of the, the talus and the navicular, which have been pressed down into contact with the ground because of the fallen arches. Supination, a little, little more obscure, but that just simply means the foot is twisted in such a way as to exaggerate the um, medial arch of the foot. And you can feel that even in your own foot. If you internally rotate your knee, if you stand up and internally rotate your knee, it pushes your foot downward. It rolls it inward into a pronated position. If you externally rotate your knee, it twists the foot into a supinated position. It raises the arch and puts pressure on the outside edge of the foot. So here were these two tracks. They were clearly the same individual, the same length, same toe configuration, very distinctive, big distal pad on the big toe, uh, quite, you know, quite idiosyncratic of this individual. And yet here, and, and two casts by two individuals uh, who never really collaborated much in the field. I mean, uh, early on they did a little bit, but then they had some fall out. Wes and Paul didn't always get along with one another, I don't think. But, uh, uh, but this subtlety of this supination pronation introduced in, in a perfect anatomical form. There's just no way. I mean, to suggest that this was something that these two concocted. Well, tell you what, Paul, you make a set of tracks over here and, and, and put the foot in a supinated position. I can just, you know, it's laughable just to imagine them having this conversation, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, again, that's another, for me, that was another smoking gun. I mean, it was just as clear. But, unfortunately, see, it's, it's subtle. And to someone who's not uh, versed and familiar with this kind of anatomy and function of the foot, it's a little obscure, and it's like, well, what, what is he talking about? You know, what is he? You know, he's he's overthinking. <laughs> of course, they can't exist. So I don't care how how much you know. Again, I don't care how much data they think they have. It must be fake. So, Dr. Melvin, for our audience, and I think it's important we talk about belief versus hypothesis. Is I think oftentimes there's this misconception with listeners that. When scientists like yourself or Dr. Bendernagel or Grover Krantz or others before you really entered the field, that this work is a belief system. And, you know, as we know, it, it's not. It's actually just a hypothesis. But can you speak to you and Dr. Bendernagel's work on casting the Gigantopithecus theory and really how that's evolved with new discoveries? When it, you're very right to make that distinction. And, and, and the, you know, in, invariably, when a journalist uh, usually is conducting an interview, one of the first questions that they ask or did more frequently was, so you believe in Bigfoot? With a question mark. And I would sometimes surprise them and just say, no, and pause, <laughs> let, let it sink in. And they were, they were flummoxed and didn't know what to do. And uh, I'd say, I'd, I'd go and, you know, wax into my little sermonette on the role of belief or the lack of role of belief in science. It's not a belief system. It's not, it's a belief as used in, uh, in just colloquial sense usually connotes a position of faith. You know, you accept something in the absence of, of confirming evidence. Um, and some may argue, you know, I mean, we could, we could argue about the uh, splitting hairs over the definition of, uh, you know, the scriptural definition of faith, uh, the, the evidence of things not seen, the substance of things hoped for, you know, that even believing people often will point to substantial experiences that bolster their faith. But for the, for the simplicity of the discussion, faith usually connotes the acceptance of something in the absence of proof, whereas I am convinced on the basis of the evidence at hand that, that at the very least the investigation of the question, the pursuit of the question is justified. Uh, if not, uh, going even that next step, I, I think I'm justified and I'm convinced in, in concluding in a preliminary fashion, as, as John so eloquently developed, you know, the theme that he developed in his book, Big, as far as he's concerned, Bigfoot has been discovered. It just hasn't been recognized by the scientific community formally, but it has been discovered. And and I'd have to concur with, with that attitude. But that is based on evidence. It's based on uh, on uh, you know, the documentation of, uh, of, of evidence that uh, forms the basis for that conviction. Now, as far as what it is, that's that's an interesting question, and it's one that, uh, you know, it may be getting the cart before the horse, but 
I do think it's an important exercise because it, you know, it goes back to establishing a context and and placing this within the existing paradigm. Um, you know, is is the assertion by so many that it can't exist justified? What would it be if it did if it was recognized to exist? And and certainly we'll we'll, we'll ascertain that with uh, with uh, more inclusiveness later on. But but uh, as you pointed out, Gigantopithecus long was uh, a, uh, a a point of uh, departure because in it you had a creature that was the right size in the right place at the right time. I mean, it was just as simple as that. Um, the question remained: Was it bipedal? And you know, Grover Krantz made some arguments and uh, of of, uh, of some some strength and, and debatable strength, perhaps, but as to why he thought it would be um, bipedal, based on the configuration of the jaw and his inferred position of the neck and the posture, the upright posture, as opposed to the more pronograde or uh, you know quadrupedal posture of other of other apes. Um, I would add to that argument the you know what we know about the um, shoulder anatomy and the hand and wrist and elbow, the entire upper arm, for that matter, of arm hanging apes uh, make it um, less likely that an animal the size and weight of a bigfoot would be walking on all fours. It's its forelimb was is just not designed for that. It's not designed like a quadruped. It's designed like an an arm hanging, more upright creature that um, uh, would be better off walking on two legs with some modifications to uh, the hind limb and pelvis. Um, so, I mean, you could argue, you could argue that those modifications could be made in the forelimb just as well as in the hind limb, but the, 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 the fact of the matter is when you look at Patty on the Patterson Gimlin film and the descriptions of the way in which uh, the arm swings, that suggests that no, the arm hasn't been modified to that form of a quadruped. Otherwise, when it stood up and walked on its hind legs, its forelimbs would look like a bear. You know, that's one of the most distinguishing characteristics: the way the bear holds its forelimbs. So, uh, Gigantopithecus, the right size, the right place, at the right time, bipedal? Big question mark. Now, there was someone, uh, Gordon Strasenberg, and I've fallen out of contact with him. I don't even know if he's about still, but he had long been an advocate of the Paranthropus model. And that always struck me as odd because uh, and, and difficult to defend because you've got a, a species of hominin that did persist in Africa up until probably, you know, one and a half million years ago, at least in the fossil record. Uh, but it's in the wrong place then at the wrong time, and it's the wrong size. It only stood about five, five and a half feet tall. Um, and uh, so how do you get it from Africa into North America and get it from five and a half feet tall to eight and a half feet tall? That seemed like a, a bit of a stretch when Gigantopithecus offered, you know, had, had fewer question marks, fewer missing parts to, to replace. Well, then my, my thinking shifted a little bit on that. I mean, there were those who would argue that uh, because of the large question mark about bipedalism in Gigantopithecus and the fact that bipedalism is such a hallmark of the hominin radiation, those species, since our divergence from a shared common ancestor with chimpanzees, that it, it would have to also be a hominin. That would be the, the most conservative interpretation if, if it did exist. Well, one, uh, parsimony. I'm not an advocate, a fan of the misapplication of, of parsimony. The notion, the the er erroneous notion that the simplest explanation is more likely to be true. That's not what parsimony was ever intended to be. It simply was a heuristic tool which recognized that science advances by falsifying a hypothesis. It's easier to find the exception than it is to prove and demonstrate all the positive cases that could be out there. So if we advance by falsification, we would, to do it in a more orderly fashion, we start with the simplest explanation and try to knock the legs out from under it first. And if we can do that, then we mo remodify our hypothesis or modify it and then move on and, and, and add 
additional variables. Occam, an Occam's razors, razor, Occam basically stated that we should not add factors unnecessarily to our explanations. And that's what he was getting at. We should first start with a simple explanation, and if we can falsify it, then we elaborate. But nature has shown us over and over again that the, the true explanation is more often than not very complicated. Rarely does nature solve a problem in the simplest fashion because it doesn't have that foreknowledge. You know, it has no, you know, uh, when, when a species evolves, it doesn't have some goal uh, beyond the horizon that it's aiming for because it has no knowledge of the, of the future, right. uh, of future conditions. Going back to where you started and where you are now, if you had to recast the hypothesis, where are you at with it today? Well, I, I think that those those two candidates still uh, uh, present the most reasonable starting point, the most reasonable null hypotheses that uh, we would try to knock the legs out from under, we would try to falsify. Uh, you know, Gigantopithecus, and, and the, the thing that those two share in common uh, uh, are, the, are, one, they both exhibit adaptations for what is called Durophagy. Um, they have a very robust masticatory apparatus. The jaws are deep. The teeth are very large. They they sport uh, thick enamel on their teeth. They have short canines that allow the jaws to grind in a side to side fashion, which is prevented by the interlocking projecting canines that we find in other hominoids uh, that uh, uh, tend to have thinner enamel and uh, more crested uh, molars and premolars. Uh, so both, both Paranthropus, see Paranthropus uh, uh, or the robust Australopithecine represent a, a, a branch, parallel branch if you will, that, that um, uh, carved out a niche by being able to chew uh, food items in their diet that were unavailable to the gracile Australopithecine. Likewise, Gigantopithecus represents a lineage that has likewise um, evolved in parallel or convergently similar masticatory apparatus, although they had different diets. I mean, the mechanical properties of their diets were the same. Their diets are actually were different based on stable isotope analysis of the enamel in, in those teeth. So, um, uh, so they're, they're similar in that in that fashion. They also are similar in that on the one case you have what is almost certainly an ape. I mean, when it was first discovered, Gigantopithecus was thought to be a giant hominid because of the thick enamel. It was thought that you could divide ape ancestors into one pile based on thin enamel and hominid ancestors based on thick enamel into a second pile. Turns out that isn't the case. They're, you know, both lineages have representation on both sides of that aisle representing their, uh, or um, reflecting their um, dietary adaptation. Uh, so convergently, they have similarities, even though they're more distantly related. So, you know, uh, this, this whole notion of whether it's an ape or whether it's a hominin is, is, is kind of superfluous, because if it is an ape, like if, it, if Gigantopithecus is indeed a large ape, and it's descended from that, then it is an ape. And, and, it's, and the term relic hominoid still would apply fine because the hominoid rather than hominid encompasses all of the great apes, the superfamily hominoidea. Um, if it's a hominin, if it's bipedal because it, it has inherited that adaptation from a common ancestor shared with those forms that eventually gave rise to humans, it is a very early offshoot because in both cases they have no real, no tool use to, to speak of. There have been some digging sticks attributed to, uh, to Paranthropus, but you know, that's akin to now uh, the uh, evidence that, uh, you well, that, that, that chimpanzees fish with uh, sticks for termite or use sticks which they spear uh, little galagos with and pull them out of trees or uh, orangutans now have been using sticks to fish with. So that uh, 
but otherwise they're essentially uh, acultural. They, they are without uh, a, a, a tool technology. They don't have a toolkit. They use opportunistically uh, objects in their environment, which with some modification perhaps, for, but then they don't, they don't carry that stick around with them. They don't, you know, tie it to their waist or put it in the backpack or stick it in a basket and take it with them. And so they're very different. I, you know, there, there's no anatomies and no behaviors attributed to Sasquatch, credibly, and put it that way, credibly attributed to Sasquatch that can't be accommodated within the sphere of anatomies and behaviors of, of other great apes and early hominids. Yeah, and before I forget to mention it, and I know, you know, all of our listeners are appreciative of your willingness to work in media production and TV specials, you know, albeit some very dramatized, like Bigfoot captured. However, I just wanted to say that, you know, one of the things that Paul and I really appreciate is your willingness to be tolerant to that outer edge and, you know, your willingness to attend events that skate that outer edge, like the supernatural or alien theory. So uh, I guess I just wanted to say thank you for doing your best to be tolerant as a scientist, as, you know, I don't think, you know, a lot of people realize how strong the belief systems are, you know, in some of these subcultures. I got to share this one with you because this was just hilarious. I, I finally agreed to speak at a at a MUFON event. It was a joint event actually um, uh, held in Pennsylvania between MUFON and and Eric Altman's organization. And uh, so I was there for both days. So it was actually turned out to be quite fun to interact with the attendees at the MUFON conference. And I was sitting next to uh, the keynote speaker at the MUFON portion. He had his table with uh, and was uh, autographing and, si and uh, selling his books, and then I was next door. Well, and on Saturday, actually, there was a lot of interest uh, by the MUFON attendees in what I was doing. But this one lady was in front of this gentleman and was actually kind of monopolizing his time. She was going on and on and on about all her theories and hypotheses, but she was going on at great length about the, the uh, labyrinth of caves in Oregon that harbor this reptilian race uh, of, alien, of aliens, uh, of, of the course, reptilian yeah. forms. <laughs> and he was trying to be very polite, but the people behind her were getting a little impatient. And gradually she was getting nudged further and further uh, to the side, marginalized <laughs> a little bit, until before she realized that she was in front of me and, re and was telling me about all this stuff about these reptilians and so forth. And then all of a sudden she realized that she was no longer talking to this other gentleman. And she looks down at the table, uh, you know, trying to, to ascertain where she actually was, saw my books and casts of footprints. She goes, oh. Oh, this is this is Bigfoot. Oh, I don't believe in that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, reptiles under under Oregon are just fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Game that's on right. That one. <laughs> uh, just uh, real quick, and I don't I don't want to lose this because we get so many requests about it, and I'm actually surprised how many people don't know about your 3D printed skeleton oh, project. Yeah, right. And c can we talk about that project? And sure. just because it's so. Awesome to us, but I want to make sure that people are aware of what you did. Right. Well, and, and you pointed out the the context in which it was in, and I have to say, uh, I, I don't want to be uh, saddled with any credit for that documentary uh, that depicted that dramatized capture. That that was uh, that was kind of came out of left field, and and uh, they had alluded to something along those lines but I had no idea what shape it was going to actually take. And so my interview, was, which was done before all that, uh, before all that gelled, uh, was uh, totally independent. But, uh, and, and, and quite separate, in fact, from this project, which was done almost independently. But they wanted to, uh, they wanted to employ, it, it actually started from a request to employ some modern technologies of 3D printing, somehow involving the Sasquatch data, and we talked about different possibilities. And you know, I mentioned well, you could you could do a footprint cast, but it wouldn't be very impressive. I mean, they're not that different. I said, but maybe a skull. You could do. Uh, you know, there have been other artistic interpretations of a reconstruction of a Gigantopithecus skull. There was actually a gentleman who who found in the literature description of Gigantopithecus teeth that were actually one third bigger than the molars in the jaw uh, specimen that Grover used as the basis for his reconstruction of Gigantopithecus. So 
assuming that that uh, you know larger teeth would be in a larger skull, he set about to in, to create his interpretation. Really quite impressive. I mean, the size is what's impressive too. But I said you could you could 3D print that. And they go, well, that might be interesting. And then after some thought, they came back and they said, no, we want to do an, an, a whole skeleton. And I said, a whole skeleton. <laughs> and I said, are you sure? And they said, we want to make it 10 feet tall. I said, well, 10 feet tall is a little bit excessive. You know, you, well, well, let's go with eight and a half feet. I, I guarantee you it will still be impressive, but it's a little more in line with, you know, averages of, of reports. And they said, okay, okay. And, and I said, you know, you could just print half a skeleton. If you wanted to, you could stand it up next to a mirror, and it would look like a full skeleton. It would save you a lot of time and a lot of effort. And then I, then we, so we, as I sat there and I go, hmm, uh, brainstorming, well, how should we do this? I, uh, you know, I knew having worked with our, our techs a little bit in the uh, Idaho Virtualization Laboratory, I, um, uh, you know, they're, they're very skilled and all, but I didn't want to start from scratch. So I said, I thought, well, why don't we take a very robust pre-human skeleton uh, of a hominid as our starting point, and we can scan it, and once we have that digital model, we can then modify it. You know, we can do all sorts of manipulations to it. And so um, not too long ago, uh, researchers had uh, created a composite, complete composite skeleton of Neanderthal. And so I thought, well, maybe, and bone clones had licensed the uh, replication of that. So we got permission to use that to scan and, and create a, a facsimile. And, uh, and then set it out to modify it. So the question is, how do you modify it? Well, of course, the, the uh, Neanderthal skeleton that they created is only about five foot four inches tall. They were short, very stout individuals, but they had also very disproportionately short limbs, especially the upper limbs, as cold adaptations. I mean, similar to um, you know modern day Inuits, actually even more extreme than modern day Inuits. Uh, as cold adaptation, so we'd have to lengthen the limbs. So, well, and so the question was, how much? How, how are we going to do this? And I thought, rather than just do it as a pure speculation based on uh, you know anecdotal descriptions and so forth and impressions, let's let's start with something a little more concrete. Uh, because I'm quite convinced in the authenticity of the Patterson Gimlin film. Let's take that figure as our model for proportions. You know, and she's just one individual. So obviously, if we were trying to model a typical human, if you just picked one individual, it may or may not approximate a typical. But let's at least we have uh, some basis for this comparison, and some of that um, of that inference of proportions had already been done. So uh, I I pulled out down from the shelf John Green's book on the track of the Sasquatch, and in that he had made careful tracings of the figure and uh, to, to create kind of a, you know, it looks kind of like a big uh, uh, snowman almost in outline because she's so bulky and massive. But he then had, uh, based on the 14 and a half inch footprint, he had made approximate uh, uh, sizes. Well, the absolute sizes weren't so much of interest as were the proportions because we were going to make it much bigger than Patty was measuring coming in at you know six and a half to seven feet in height, and so we basically we we, we started stretching and uh, uh, pr um, lengthening the limbs, widening the pelvis was important and as well as the shoulders, uh, because the torso of Patty is is hugely broad and deep in the front to back orientation as well. She's almost as deep as she is wide, uh, just a very barrel-shaped uh, torso. <clears throat> but then also we had this skull. Uh, the Neanderthal skull was not appropriate because Neanderthals have very large cranial capacities. In fact, their average cranial capacity is larger than that for anatomically modern humans. Um, and they didn't have uh, the similarities of this durophagy adaptations of the jaws that I talked about earlier. Um, one of the things that's quite impressive is, uh, you know, and I've used this in many of my presentations, I, I, I created a slide where I've got the um, composite of a Australopithecus or Paranthropus boisei, 
from East Africa, juxtaposed next to a close-up of Patty from the Patterson-Gimlin film. And point for point, the cranial proportions are identical. And this is interesting because Patty was filmed in 1967. This skull was not discovered until the late 60s. It wasn't described in print until the early 70s. And the first published uh, analysis, detailed biomechanical analysis of the uh, significance of the facial proportions and chewing adaptations of this species weren't published until, you know, almost a decade later. So Patty, the Patterson-Gimlin film, anticipated a, a, an adaptation, a suite of adaptations of the cranium and the size of the body, the gut, you know, and so forth of an animal this size, uh, gut capacity and so forth, um, of, of a robust australopithecine by over a decade. Now, that's pretty interesting when you think that, you know, what inspiration would there otherwise be out there for a, a giant, hairy ape, man ape? Well, it would be King Kong would probably be the only thing, and, and which is basically a, a variation on the theme of a giant gorilla with a projecting face and big canine teeth and et cetera. So that's interesting, but that, that's an aside. So the question was, but that, that leads to what we did. We, we just plucked off the Neanderthal skull and replaced it with a, a, a um, uh, enlarged, robust Australopithecus. Uh, we used the Australopithecus boisei cranium as the model for that, and it was fascinating because now, now the one thing I would caution your listeners is some, many people overthought uh, what this implied, what this represented. Um, you know, our goal was not to make an exact model of a Sasquatch skeleton. It was rather to make a skeleton that conveyed, a model that conveyed the size and proportions of this creature. And we might gain some insights, but mostly it was a straw man to provide the basis for discussion of could an animal this size make a living? And, and what would it, what would it, what would the implications of this body size be for its locomotion, for its diet? for its ability to, you know, evade detection and so forth. And and that was what was fascinating. Um, and and it, it was, as, as often is the case, you know, they, they want it done yesterday. So there was a big push to get it done. I didn't have a lot of time to sit down and uh, and work with the techs in uh, the details, working out the details, you know, trying to scale all of the bones, not only lengthen them, but, of course, enlarge their width and so forth. So, for example, someone commented to me how he thought that the femur would be much, much thicker than that. And I said, well, you're absolutely right, because unfortunately the tech lengthened it to the proper length but didn't thicken it out. So when he, when he enlarged the pelvis, you know, the, the, the head of the femur is dwarfed by the socket, the acetabulum on the pelvis, because the, we didn't fine-tune it like that. But what was really fascinating, one of the insights that, that immediately became apparent, and, and this was, for me, it, it was worth the, the whole endeavor uh, beyond the, 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 the wow factor, which unfortunately was what was uh, limited to, uh, it was largely limited to on the documentary. A lot of our interesting discussions uh, like this about how we came to arrive at this and how, what process, what thought processes went into it, you know, it didn't make it past the editors, but uh, but it was uh, it was the observation that many witnesses have made that these creatures don't have a neck. Well, obviously they have a neck. They have to have a neck. You know, I would be really surprised if there weren't seven cervical vertebrae there, as as are present in all mammals. But why why were, do they have this impression of the lack of neck? Well, Dr. Krantz had 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 made some suggestions about maybe a more forward position of the head on the spine or uh, or the shoulders, just the shoulder girdle being higher up on the rib cage and so forth. But um, uh, but what, what became so obvious is when we scaled this up, even with a body that was based primarily on a rather modern hominoid, um, hominid, hominin specifically, uh, Neanderthal that is, uh, when we when we set this robust australopithecine skull on the neck of the Neanderthal, it covered up the neck. 
the jaws were so deep and the, the neurocranium uh, surrounding the brain was relatively small that these big, deep jaws pretty much obscured the cervical vertebrae. And then when, and to, to the point where the jaws almost touched the clavicles, the collarbones in front. And when you looked, considered from behind, and uh, the, uh, m the massive trapezius that would be required uh, uh, to support that heavy face, um, and coming up perhaps a little bit higher on the back of the skull, than is found in um, in modern humans, which who have a very gracile um, trapezius. Uh, combine that with the very broad shoulders, so you get this this flaring cape-like uh, trapezius. Uh, there's hardly any neck to be seen from behind either. And so that was I thought that was fascinating to mm -hmm. see that and to uh, understand the. Uh, you know, the correlated anatomy, underlying head. But, but then what was really fascinating is you could take, you know, I, I, on, on one of the illustrations that I created, I had a posterior view of the um, Bigfoot model standing alongside the human skeleton, and then I had, um, had uh, digitally drawn in the outline of the big trapezius with its attachment up on the skull. And, and then if you take a clip of the appropriate perspective, from the Patterson Gimlin film, you see it identically. I mean, it's exactly this big cape like trapezius flaring out to these broad, broad shoulders, you know, that measure, you know, three and a half feet across probably, and then going up and attaching relatively higher on the back of the skull. Not as high as on a gorilla, but certainly not as low as on a human. It's pretty much intermediate. And there's even, you know, a little bulge as that muscle flares away from the back of the skull, um, it's just, yeah, it's just suddenly the anatomy is just, boom, it's there. Now, what is the, what is the purpose of having those insertion points uh, different than, say, on a human? What's, what's, what's the evolutionary advantage for right. that? Well, they have been greatly reduced in humans because of the greater balance that is present in our, in our cranium. Our face has reduced so much in size, particularly the jaws and teeth, by comparison to the uh, 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 disproportionate enlargement of our brain and the position of the foramen magnum, the opening that allows the exit of the spinal cord from the, from the brain case, is positioned far underneath the skull uh, and so centrally positioned that with very little muscle effort, the head is balanced on the spine. You know, I have a tendency to fall asleep if I'm sitting still for very long, and, <laughs> and uh, I, I'm pretty good at, at balancing my head to where it doesn't bob backward or forward. Um, you know, and many of my students have mastered that. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I was going to mention well. your students probably are experts at that as well. So yeah. Yeah. So we have we have much more um, uh, wimpy, if you will, or, or, or uh, smaller trapezius, and the attachments are very restricted and tucked up underneath the base of our skull. By comparison, a gorilla that has a foramen magnum that is much more posteriorly positioned. Um, has a base of a skull that is more vertically, more more inclined, not perfectly vertically, but but it's angled upward and a much greater surface area for these very large neck muscles that then have to counter the tendency for that heavy facial skeleton to pull downward on the the head, pivoting at the at the cranial vertebral joint, and so um, you, we can see a progression in hominids as the position of the foramen magnum has moved forward and the brain has increased in size, also bringing that what's called the nuchal plane downward and reduced in size as the neck muscles then had um, less demands for balancing the head because the, the head was already more balanced given the position over the spine and the gradual reduction in flat reduction of the jaws and flattening of the face, uh, lending further to the, the balance. So again, Sasquatch, uh, you know, one of the things that has been commented about Patty is that she walks with a slight forward lean of about five degrees. 
And so she doesn't exhibit a perfectly upright posture. I mean, she's on the move all the time. She doesn't probably doesn't lock her knees very effectively and stand, you know, uh, still. Uh, when she's not moving, she's squatting down or she's lying down, you know. And and otherwise, when she's moving, she's she's moving and she's often moving up and down um, uh, steep terrain uh, and broken, littered uh, with obstacles that require her to have a high stepping gait. It's interesting, you know. Some I many have commented about that and even even measured the angle that she lifts her foot as she steps forward, swings forward. Um, yeah, almost as if I, you're walking in uh, swim fins or flippers. Well, right. One 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 attribution is that is that and, and her feet are longer relative to her leg length. That would certainly affect the swing, but um, it almost is an exaggerated uh, uh, stepping, like you would walk when you were say walking in, um, you know, in in scrub, with lots of short sagebrush bushes or something, or in a heath where you couldn't swing your leg, you had to lift and step and lift and step. And it was interesting because I had, in one of my primate classes, I had a student, she was actually a practicing uh, podiatrist from England who was coming back over and, and gone back to school. She was uh, getting a, a, another degree and she took my classes in elective. And uh, during one of the thing, one of the lectures, we were um, looking at the Patterson-Gimlin film and discussing it. Uh, you know, we were talking about relic hominoids. And it was funny because she chased me down after class, and she said, you know, this was bothering me. She said, the way it walked was, was really funny looking. But then I realized I've seen that before. When I had patients that spent a lot of time in rural areas where they had to hike and walk uh, through brush, they developed a high-stepping gait. And even when they walked on uh, unobstructed uh, floor or a sidewalk, they tended to lift their feet higher than your average person would, who never um, frequented that kind of um, uneven terrain. And she said that that observation alone, she said, convinced me that what you were showing this was real. <laughs> <laughs> you know your book, uh, Dr. Meldrum, your book, A Legend Meets Science, which, by the way, is an excellent book. Uh, it, it comes at the topic with a skeptic's eye, and I'll tell you, if you put this book in the hands of a skeptic they will have a very difficult time intellectualizing themselves back to being a skeptic once they realize how difficult it would be to fake these trackways. But are you planning any more books on the subject? Well, I am. I, I uh, was on sabbatical last year, and, and uh, as it turned out, as often as the case, I had too many irons in the fire. One of those <laughs> the for was foremost uh, a second book, which uh, cast the net broadly again, more, more in the spirit of uh, Ivan Sanderson's book, of looking at relic hominoids around the world, Sasquatch and other wild men. And it, it is, you know, one of the principal goals is to further develop this theme that I have been pushing, this uh, the two sides of the coin, the one side being the, the, the now recognition of the contemporaneity of multiple species in the past, the, the final... Um, uh, dispensing of the, uh, or dispelling rather, of the single species hypothesis once and for all. And on the other side of the coin, the recognition that many of these branches of this very bushy hominin tree have been recognized as persisting much more recently than ever before. So we've got, you know, there was a, a, a mandible of a Homo erectus dredged up in a fisherman's net off the coast of Taiwan that was dated at less than 10,000 years old. I examined a specimen of Homo heidelbergensis when I was in China one time that was dated to be between 12 and 20,000 years old. Homo heidelbergensis, that was the species that was the common ancestor to Neanderthals and modern humans. Um, there have been, um, well, we had the Hobbit. The dates have been pushed back a bit with uh, revised uh, analyses of the stratigraphy of the deposits, but but it was acceptable uh, uh, that it, they were less than uh, 18 to 13,000 years old. Now it's been pushed up to about 50,000. That's still 50,000 years. We have uh, Neanderthal sites that are um, less than 10,000 years. So um, again, why, <laughs> if we can recognize the existence of these things in the past, 
and their persistence up till as recently as 10 to 20,000 years, knowing how spotty the fossil record is, those, those specimens certainly don't uh, coincide with the final date uh, you know, of existence. Um, why is it so difficult to at least consider the possibility that there are relic populations in various quarters of the, of the globe? So that's the theme I want to push and present evidence, and, and certainly a lot of emphasis on the footprint evidence I've accumulated from, from uh, these possible uh, types from around the world. So that's, unfortunately, that's still a little ways off. You know, I think the manuscript's probably about two-thirds of the way written, and then uh, um, there'll be lots and lots of figures that will have to be composed and so forth. So my second field guide um, uh, served as a bit of a sneak preview, a teaser, if you will. Um, it is basically a synopsis of what the book will cover. Uh, and that book, that field guide is entitled Sasquatch Yeti and Other Wild Men of the World, a Field Guide to Relic Hominoids. And uh, so uh, your listeners can, can get a little uh, uh, taste of, uh, of where I hope to take this. Yeah, and if you don't uh, have uh, if you don't have one of Dr. Jeff Meldrum's field guides, they're a great gift. They're really interesting, and uh, hopefully, uh, uh, you folks will will purchase one of those. They're they're very fascinating. So, Dr. Meldrum, and I guess you know, I really don't know how to phrase this question, so I may struggle with it a bit. But um, you know, you have this legacy as a scientist, but you also have this legacy in the subculture of being a scientific advocate of the phenomenon of Sasquatch. And you've collected all this evidence. Um, most of that is cataloged now in the lab at Idaho State University. But one question that I think that is certainly I want to know, and I'm sure everyone in the subculture uh, should be concerned with, is really what happens you know, to that catalog post Jeff Meldrum? Does Idaho State University take that collection and sell it on eBay? What happens to the collection, and, and really what's the plan? Well, that's, that's a very real concern, I, and, I, and I appreciate it because... We've, we've witnessed, I've, I've lived here to see the passing of the guard, so to speak, with the, with the passing and loss of, of some of those, uh, you know, some of the horsemen, as they were referred to as, and, and uh, to see what uh, the good and perhaps uh, questionable uh, end result of their legacies. And, uh, you know, I was able to, to, to carry on a lot of Dr. Krantz's uh, Dr. Krantz's uh, materials, uh, it was always discouraging, you know, when he, he gifted a lot of his library to various individuals and students to see some of those books then show up on uh, used book uh, venues. Uh, that was kind of a, a poor execution of stewardship, in my opinion, but nevertheless. Um, but so I was, I was grateful that the timing of my involvement and interest coincided with uh, a reasonable passing of the baton from, from Dr. Krantz to me. Some of his materials have ended up in the Smithsonian, and in fact, they're quite interested. I've been in conversations with the collections manager there. They would, uh, they were disappointed not to get the whole thing. <laughs> and so when I, when I uh, became custodian of a, a large number of his molds and casts and, and data and so forth, they were very interested to know the final disposition. So certainly they're interested and might uh, accept. Of course, now we're uh, accept some of that material. We're going. We're getting more and more into the digital age, and uh, I've gone to uh, considerable efforts with uh, help from the Idaho Virtualization Laboratory staff to digitize, create 3D uh, files of much of the cast material, which will make it uh, hopefully, you know, packageable in perpetuity and available to many different researchers. And we're still working. I, I, I apologize to my listeners who have been very patient about public access to those archives. Uh, I've had just a string of uh, issues with the assistance in getting that web page up and going and functioning properly. So uh, that's uh, something we're working on. But uh, a little uh, early yet to talk about my my passing of the baton, <laughs> but thinking about it, we're I'm I'm working obviously. I mean, obviously, one of the ways is to get things digitized, get things into a into the digital realm. The relic hominoid inquiry, I think, is a really important way to to uh, have a lasting legacy that provides an uh, an academic venue, you know, a scholarly venue for the 
the continued discussion of this in a very serious and, and uh, scholarly fashion. And, and I'm sure that will carry on. It'll be easy to, to transfer the reins to someone uh, when that time comes on that regard, as well as, you know, other digital data files. Um, but, you know, I am, um, I am working, cultivating on a possibility where we might be able to establish uh, a facility independent of, uh, of an academic institution that will be able to provide some housing and archival uh, capacity for this kind of thing and, and, and promote ongoing research. You know, I, I haven't, it, it, the, 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 the formula has been, or the pattern has been, once individuals reach retirement, then they start uh, pursuing this for, from an academic uh, perspective uh, or capacity. Then they have started looking uh, or working more um, directly in, in this uh, arena. Um, unfortunately, you know, Dr. Krantz retired, got himself set up, and then promptly was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. And um, Dara Swindler, uh, was, uh, who has been a colleague of Dr. Krantz's at the university, he was at the University of Washington, however, a uh, well reputation um, uh, primate anatomist who, who was something of a closet, not enthusiast perhaps, but, but interested individual who, uh, who saw the merit and had just started more openly discussing it as he was preparing to retire. And then unfortunately he was taken from us shortly thereafter. So that's unfortunately been the pattern. So on the other flip side, I'm very reticent to encourage young academics to embark on this path at the present given the experiences that I had. Um, the way to do it is to uh, select a discipline that is pertinent to some facet of the investigation, be it bioacoustics, be it molecular biology, be it forensics, be it um, you know, hair analysis and uh, uh, whatever, and then become expert and established and reputation uh, uh, in that discipline, and then from that position of expertise and authority, turn your attention and, and some academic security, you know, tenure, turn your attention uh, uh, all guns blazing on this subject matter. Um, but uh, I don't, uh, you know, there's a lot of interest behind the scenes. I, you know, I'll go to meetings sometimes at my own professional meetings and, and present a poster, and I'm inundated for the entire day with uh, with people very interested in this, but they they're not in a position to openly uh, participate really or to uh, to go after it. I've had some collaborations, but again, that was one of the objectives of the relic hominoid inquiry as well was not only to provide a venue for the publication of these where these papers where they might not otherwise get published for prejudicial regions, reasons, but also it provides me as an editor an opportunity to interact with these other academics sort of behind the scenes as reviewers or more openly as commentators on papers that are submitted and, and uh, involve them in the conversation. They might not be in a position or inclined for various professional reasons to submit directly to the uh, the journal, but they can participate in that editorial capacity, and and, uh, and and that's great. I mean, because there, like I said, there's a lot of stuff that goes on behind the scenes that people are quite aware of. It looks like sometimes I'm the only person, or, or John Bindernagel and I are the only persons. There's a few other names out there, um, Angela Caparella, for example, and uh, I can't mm -hmm. think of any others. But um, it always bothers me too when people say that you know the, no scientists are taking uh, this seriously. Well, I'll wait a minute. What am I? You know, chocolate. <laughs> <Right, laughs> at, right. at, at least if you are. But, uh, but well, I guess it gives us uh, some comfort that you at least start talking to the Smithsonian, and certainly 
I think, oh, like, yeah. you know, the digital archive is, is a great idea, and um, someone had actually came to us at the uh, Sasquatch Summit and mentioned they had bought a 3D scanner for an iPhone that if they were to come across a track rather than carry yes. casting material, they would just scan the print and exactly. you know, all these great things. And, and that's all good, but then I start worrying about, you know, the digitization and, you know, the, the, the hoaxing and all the different things that could right. go into that. So if you don't have the physical cast, um, then, you know, right. maybe you start losing credibility on the digital scan, et cetera, but at least sure. having that catalog, I think, really makes a lot of sense. Well, exactly, and the technologies are getting uh, better and better, and I, I'd heard that same that same uh, feature, that same ca capacity, and, and that's very exciting because, obviously, when you're in the backcountry, it's, it's problematic to carry enough plaster and to have readily uh, available sources of water if you're not carrying it in order to uh, execute a, a cast. So uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, utilizing that kind of technology. But it does raise the very issues that you that you um, point out. And I guess, uh, you know, in, in, in many ways, that's part of the conundrum we face with uh, photographic images of alleged Sasquatches, Sasquatch encounters. You know, it, it, the, the Patterson-Gimlin film is not only unique in its uh, quality and clarity, uh, um, it really is there, but but in the um, in the actual uh, medium in which it was uh, shot, I mean that was probably the best film that he could get at that time, and it still even in in our digital age has produced an image that is remarkably um, uh, durable, if you will, to uh, under scrutiny, and uh, you know everything since then has has fallen very short. Uh, the video medium. Was very VHS video was very poor, and the ability to uh, scrutinize things like the Paul Freeman uh, footage uh, are, are limited, and then so much of the other stuff that's shot is just uh, just very poor quality. I mean, when right. uh, people get all in a in a lather trying to argue whether this, that, or the other is real, I simply point to the Patterson Gilman film and say. The bar has already been set, and we're still arguing about the veracity of that piece of the evidence. <laughs> so, it, you know, if you don't meet that standard, even if you convince yourself or convince me, what good does it do? It doesn't, you know. So, so don't don't lose friends over it. Certainly. <laughs> and do you have any final thoughts, uh, Dr. Jeff Meldrum? Well, uh, just along that theme of uh, us sort of being at a crossroads, where I think that the proliferation of the uh, and the exploitation, this proliferation of the tabloid and the exploitation of and commercialization of Sasquatch has, uh, it, it, people are very familiar with it, but, but uh, more and more people just simply don't take it seriously at all. I mean, they just see it nothing, as nothing but a, a, an item of pop culture. And um, uh, there has been uh, uh, just a slew of books published recently which is, should be motivation for me to get on, uh, you know, get on the stick and get uh, more things done and out there. But uh, there have been a number of, of skeptical perspective books that are, are are poor quality, unfortunately. But but they uh, they get rave reviews, usually from their own camps. Obviously, the <laughs> skeptics always rave about the skeptic book. But but um, it uh, it really requires that we. Um, uh, raise the bar. I mean, we talk about raising the bar with photographic evidence, but we, uh, you know, if, if anything, I, if any admonition can be given, it's that that witnesses are very conservative in their identification of possible evidence, that they don't attribute every bump in the night, every leaning tree, you know, to Sasquatch activity, and and that they're extremely conscientious about uh, not and thereby not over-interpreting, but also be very conscientious in the documentation. And we cited examples about lack of scale or, or whatnot, um, photographic quality. You know, the, I, I, uh, if I can't groom an academic to replace me in, in, say, 15 years, I hope that I will have made some contribution to the grooming of a army of citizen scientists who can collect quality data 
and present it to the scientific community in a way that it can be palatable to to those who um, uh, who might be willing to go a little out on the branch and who are secure enough in their in their careers and in their reputations that they can um, uh, avoid uh, uh, the uh, misperception of you know the subject matter and at the same time I, I, and I think that that especially over the next decade um, given the, the 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 turn of events of the previous decade that this theme of relic hominoids is gaining greater and greater acceptance. I mean, there was a an article in New Scientist magazine in 2012. Uh, it was a cover feature that that posed the 10 uh, top 10 questions facing the students of uh, researchers of human evolution today. The top 10 puzzles, call it, and one of those was. The question, are other relic hominoids, are other hominins alive today? And then they explored in this brief editorial the uh, prospect of relic hominoids. Now that wouldn't have been, <laughs> that, that would have been unthinkable to have been on the cover of a magazine, of a, of a, of a serious science magazine 20 years ago. Um, and so things are changing. And so if, if, we, can, if we can push it in you know, both sides of this, uh, the the um, uh, improvement of the receptivity of the subject that by the creation of a context, a theoretical framework that accommodates it in the scientific side, and on the other side, then address the, the issues of where's the beef, you know, where's the data, where where's the DNA. So by cult system more systematically and more um, uh, reliably collecting and documenting evidence, uh, I, I think that sh short of a fluke, like a semi-truck hitting one on the side of a, of a highway, um, that's the way, this, this is the way that we're going to get to the bottom of it, is through just hard work. This has been an absolutely fascinating hour. For our Sasquatch Syndicate listeners, if you haven't purchased Jeff Meldrum's book, Sasquatch Legend, meets science. It's a, it's a fantastic read. I know we've got into some, um, a lot of vernacular and nomenclature as it relates to foot anatomy. The book really doesn't go that deep. It's a very easy read. Yeah, I'd have to uh, second that from Paul. It's a super easy read, and uh, I think you'll be delighted if you haven't read the book. So uh, for those out there that would like to pick up a copy of the book, you can pick those up at sasquatchsyndicate.com under book club. Uh, of course, also Dr. Meldrum typically attends many conferences, has copies, and does uh, book signings. Um, but uh, if you pick up the book and you want to get it signed, come out to the International Bigfoot Conference in September. So Dr. Meldrum, thanks again for coming on Sasquatch Syndicate. We really do appreciate it. I know our listeners do as well. And we'll look forward to seeing you at an upcoming conference. Okay. My pleasure. Have a wonderful day. You. This concludes our March 2017 podcast. Sasquatch Syndicate will return on Saturday, April 1st. Thanks to all our listeners and those that have been out to our website and those following us on social media. Sasquatch is a controversial subject, so for all the believers and disbelievers and those that will tell you they have all the answers, just remember we're flying through space at 700 miles per hour. Buckle up.